Yes, we can do it. Take it from Rosie the Riveter. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our Aliyah Tazria, the fourth Aliyah of the day. We're going to be looking at this aspect of Zarat and the reasons for it, the causes of it. Again, we'll be talking more about uh, the, this aspect, but we're looking at it from a really interesting angle today, as is brought down to us from the Kehol Tumash. And <clears throat> looking at why, why do, do did the Zarat actually happen, and why don't we have it today? What you know, if if Zarat is is caused because of Lashon Hara, well, there's plenty of Lashon Hara that we see today. Um, so the question becomes, why don't we have this spiritual affliction today? What would be the reason for it? It's, it's an interesting concept. We'll be looking at it. Um, and it goes along, the opening words, as you'll see, kind of goes along with my uh, thumbnail that I put up today with Rosie the River. But now, uh, Rosie the River may be something that everyone is familiar with in the United States, although not everybody is uh, super cognizant of history, if you, but we have lots of viewers uh, who live outside of the United States, and you may not be familiar with that particular iconic uh, picture that, that is on the thumbnail. Um, for those of you who live in the United Kingdom or Canada uh, or other parts of the world, which we have um, probably about a third of our viewers who watch internationally. So anyway, let me just give you a brief little history here because it is pretty interesting. So that uh, picture on the uh, thumbnail is Rosie the Riveter, and uh, uh, she passed away. She was she was a real person, by the way. She passed away when she was 96 years old. I don't remember what year she passed away. Um, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I think that Rosie um, worked at a plant in Alabama, I think. But I could be wrong about that. But that was a depiction during World War II, because in the United States during World War II, uh, a lot of our manpower was in the military. Uh, everybody uh, went into the military with great enthusiasm to destroy uh, the Nazis and, uh, and, and the Imperial Japanese. Um, and so <clears throat> we were short on manpower. Back in those days, women didn't typically work. Uh, it was quite unusual to have women who worked outside the home. And for that matter, there was plenty of women who actually joined the military as well and supportive roles, particularly as nurses and things of that nature. So we were just short on manpower across the board. And what happened, uh, what needed to happen is that all of a sudden uh, we needed to manufacture a lot of military equipment. We needed to make planes and jeeps and tanks and all a host of other things. And the United States did. Uh, to quote the famous Japanese Admiral Yamamoto, uh, after Pearl Harbor, everybody in Japan was excited. They felt like they had really, uh, you know, got one over on the United States and so on and so forth. They thought victory was uh, just pr practically guaranteed. And uh, Admiral Yamamoto famously said, I fear that all we have done is awaken the sleeping giant. Well, it turns out that he was true. He was correct, rather. That was true. And so the United States started to producing... Um, all this equipment. And in fact, it was, it, we really overwhelmed the Axis powers with the amount of equipment we were able to uh, make. We made like 10 tanks to their one, uh, maybe more than that. We made like, you know, 50 planes to their one. It was, it was ridiculous. The, the, the sky was blackened with the, the, the amount of bombers that we actually made. It was, it was actually quite remarkable. Um, but anyway, uh, Rosie the Riveter was the women who went to work riveting putting in rivets into the uh machinery to make the planes and make the um tanks and things like that uh and so a lot of women put on their dungarees and went to the to the factories and started making all of this stuff that went to war and so hence hence rose of the riveter and that became a campaign of her on the um on the posters that say yes we can do it or we can we can do it actually was the campaign. I, I added the yes, but we can do it was the campaign, and it was that women can make this uh, make this happen. But Shua says she passed away in 1997. Yeah, she was 96. So um, anyway, why does this have to do with Tazria? 
Well, as we're about to read into the insights here, uh, it's it actually talks about in the Kelp Humash that we can we can keep the laws of Moses, and uh, there is an there is an association with Zarat and those who actually keep the law of Moses, uh, which we're going to get to that in a second. But I want one of the things I've I've realized recently, particularly, <clears throat> is that because you know I I, I look for certain things that people say repetitively. It's almost like uh, talking points from hell. Um, and that is that no, the thing that's often repeat said to me is that no one can keep the law of Moses. It's an impossibility. And no one can be saved by, by works or whatever. No one can do it. But really the main thing is no one can keep the law. It's, an imp it's impossible to keep the law of Moses. Completely impossible. And what's remarkable about that is that, biblically speaking, if you if one just does a cursory reading of the Bible, one would discover that that was patently false, absolutely not true. It is a, um, I mean, logically, and I've I've broken this down many times, but logically speaking, it does it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Where does it come from? Well, Paul's letters, of course. So we're all the other nonsensical, heretical, completely bogus information comes from. It comes from the, a, a guy's mail. But when you actually look at the Bible, it actually discounts everything that guy said. Um, in fact, this is such an important, in my opinion, this is such a prominent attitude that I'm actually considering making it the theme of this coming week's drosh that it is possible to keep the laws of Moses and actually focusing in on the copious uh, verses in the Tanakh that, that point this out, because this mindset exists in, in people's heads. And I, I, that's why it's easy for them to dismiss Torah observance because no one can do it anyway. And it's crazy to even, so why should I even try? It's like saying, can you lift that thousand pounds can you deadlift that thousand pounds over there? Well, no, no one can do that. Uh, I don't know if anybody can lift a deadlift a thousand pounds or not. That's a lot. Let's just say two thousand. Um, two thousand pounds. Can you de deadlift it? No, I can't. So I'm not even going to try. That's that's the brainwashing, right? That's the mental conditioning. That's the that's the that's what people are taught. And of course, it's not true. Hence the Rosie the Riveter. Yes, we can do it. The answer is yes, we can keep the laws of Moses. Yes, we can keep the Torah. All 613? Sigh. Not all 613 are for each individual, okay? But if you're going to ask me philosophically, can we, all, can we all keep 613? The answer, of course, is yes. When we do it in community. But again... Yes, there are 613 commandments. And, and, and listen, and lately, I think I think that lately, this is my theory. I don't have any proof of this, but I I, I believe that theoret in, in theory, some pastors and some lay leaders in Christianity have recently discovered, recently discovered that there are in fact 613 commandments in the Torah. Because in my 30 years of ministry, all you ever heard people talk about was the Ten Commandments, and as far as they knew, that's all there were. And they only believed in nine of them. I um, mean, the, the list, then sometimes they scratched off the eight because they kind of, you know, kind of negotiated on a couple. But um, definitely the nine commandments. That, that's what the Charlton Heston movie should have been called, the nine commandments. But recently in the last, you know, recent time frame, all of a sudden I hear Christians talk about 613. I guarantee you they didn't know this until a few weeks ago. And so I... Now, so now what I see is that that it, that number is being used as a fear tactic, a fear mongering in that population. They're telling people, golly, Moses, do, did y'all realize there's 613 laws in Judaism? No, who can keep 613? Of course, I want to remind you that if you look at your state's penal code, or and I say state, in the United States, but really in Canada and Germany and France and the United Kingdom, look at your penal code. Look how many how many laws are on the penal code that you actually keep. 
Rabbi, what do you mean? No, I'm serious. Look at your penal code. There are thousands of laws, I would I would guess, in, the, in your go local government's penal code, and you keep a lot of them, probably all of them. You know how I know that? Because you're not in jail. One of the ways I know that you keep them is that you're not behind bars. Well, no, it's impossible to keep the law. Then how come you're not are being arrested right now? <laughs> right? I mean, if it was impossible, then you would be incarcerated. So obviously it's possible to keep the law because we do it every day. How many of you drive and you keep the laws of driving? You stop at stoplights, you stop at stop signs, you 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 when you enter a, a, a school zone, you drive 20 miles an hour. How many of you raise your hand out there if you do that? Well, great. I want to encourage you and tell you that that means you can follow the law. Isn't that amazing? You can follow the law. Don't you feel good about yourself? You know, that's, Judaism is a very positive message. Yes, we can do it. That's positive. That people, people are inspired by positivity. We can. We will. We shall. The other side of the fence is extremely negative. You can't. You won't. You'll fail. Do you better do this? You're going to go to hell. Judaism doesn't talk like that. That is that is so depressing. That's Debbie Downer. We're 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 Rosie Riveter. Judaism is Rosie Riveter. The other guys are Debbie Downer. And so anyway, yes, we can. And uh, this is a very important thing. And, and it's interesting because this yes, we can spirit is actually related to the con. The conversation about Zarat, which is very fascinating. So let's jump into that. But before we do, let's say bonjour to all of our members. Bonjour, Peaches, formerly from Georgia. Hope you're doing great. Bonjour, Hava. Hope you're doing fantastic. Good morning, Devora. Bonjour to Russ and Jen. Good, glad you guys are here. Bonjour to Kristen. Good morning, Kristen. Hope you're doing fantastic. Good morning to Leah. Hope you're doing fantastic as well there in sunny Florida. Hope it's sunny. And uh, bonjour to Denise, to Marita. Good to see you. Yes, we're going to see you in two weeks, Marita. We're looking so forward to seeing you and Patrick. It's going to be a beautiful time. Good morning. Bonjour to Chris and Crystal and your children. Good to see you. Um, bonjour to Lori. Good morning to you. Good Bonjour to Shoshana Brenner and to Yosef. Yosef there in South Fort Worth area. Bonjour to Ariella. Good to see you this morning. I, I, all of a sudden, I start want to see you sing being, Be Our Guest, Be Our Guest, from, uh, but I, I'm not going to sing it. Bonjour, Chanel. Good morning to you uh, from uh, Virginia. Gooch, Goochland, Virginia. Is that where they make the Gucci purses? Good morning to you, Leah. And good morning to you, Emmanuel from Nigeria. And uh, Emmanuel, did you know about the Rose of the River? I'm just curious because you're from Nigeria. I'm, I'm, I'm going to assume you didn't know that story. And if you didn't, that's fine. Obviously, you're not from the United States. So it makes a lot of sense. I'm just curious if you did, if you knew that already. Some people may know. Maybe it's more international than I think. Uh, good morning to Nellie Grace. Hope you're doing great. Bonjour to, to Katura. Bonjour to Amana. Uh, shalom to you and your family, Amana. Bonjour to Yolanda, bonjour to Milka, bonjour, bonjour to Sarah. Sarah Steckley, we can't wait to see you guys for Pesach. I know you're coming in with your new baby. So cute. I was handsome like that, or cute like, I should say cute. I was cute like that once. Bonjour to Nava. Nava, you guys, you and Sheila are coming in. I can't wait to see you guys as well. Bonjour to Z-Ray. Welcome to you, sir. Good bonjour to Corin. Yeah, Corin, I know y'all can't make it here for Pesach, which I'm very sad about that. But I am uh, looking forward to seeing you guys for this uh, Sukkot holiday. Bonjour to Sergio. Uh, hey, Sergio, you guys coming for Pesach? No pressure. Just asking. I wasn't sure. Bonjour to Aniel. And who else do we have? Bonjour to Geneva Miller. Good morning, ma'am. Glad you were here. And Brenda Jones, First Fights Club. Good morning to you. Lola. Good morning, Lola from the United. Lola, did you know about Rosa the River? Um, Dana, Dana, not Dana. <laughs> Dana is a yogurt. Dana is a person. Good morning, Dana. 
And uh, who else do we have? Rebbit scene. Oh, look at the rebbit scene. She looks so beautiful this morning, like 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 a lily that has that has uh, bloomed. Shangria, Shangria la de da, Shangria la de da. I like that actually. <laughs> Shangria. La... Good morning, Matthew. Good morning to you. Good morning, Levi. Good morning. And uh, who else do we have? Uh, I think I think that's everybody so far. Shangria, we do follow God. Hence the Judaism part. <laughs> follow God, Shangria says. Okay, we will, and we are. And that's how that's why we're here. God wants peace for all of us. Well, that is if you're in the covenant. Yes. True. Good morning, Eliezer, and good morning, Kathy. Uh, Lola did not know about Rosie the Riveter. Well, that's good. Um, well, I'm, you know, just curious. I just, it's just a curiosity question. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting. There's lots about the United Kingdom I don't know about. So, um, wish I knew more. All right. So let's look at the insight here from, um, the KO too much. This is something I've been meaning to read for the last couple of days and just didn't get to it. This is a quick paragraph because it has to do, uh, with the concept of, of, of pure and impure. And I just wanted to cover this right quick. So it says, it say, or as we say in Spanish, it says, the temple and its rituals are designated or de de designed, excuse me, designed to connect us with God. That's the purpose of the temple and its rituals. Now, that's a very important sentence because a lot of people think falsely that the purpose of the temple was about salvation. Salvation, salvation. You had to go. And get your sins forgiven so that you could be severed. In fact, uh, the, the the book of Hebrews, which is really a letter, it's not a book at all. Um, there's no book of Galatians. There's no book of Ephesians. There's no book of Hebrews. They're letters. They're not books. But I digress. Um, in the letter to the Hebrews, <clears throat> it talks about how that the blood of, of bulls ha could not ever take away sin. Uh, blah, blah, blah. None of that's true, actually. Um, it's not true. How do we know it's not true? Well, the Tanakh says it's not true. Isn't that odd? So actually, the Tanakh does say, in fact, it's interesting. So this is just an interesting phenomenon. So God said that if you offer up, you know, the, uh, and by the way, the letter to the Hebrews is talking about specifically the blood of goats and bulls. It's talking about Yom Kippur. Because that's when you offered up goats and bulls. But I digress. God said that when you do that, your sins will be wiped away. You'll have atonement. That's what he said. The writer of Hebrews comes and says, well, because we did it year after year, it's obvious that's showing us that it doesn't wipe it away. That's why you have to do it every year. No, it doesn't. How'd you draw that conclusion? Hashem said, do it year after year. And now you're saying, because we do it year after year, obviously it's because it didn't work. But wait, God said it worked. Yeah, I know. But I, I, he said it worked, but what does he know? I'm telling you it doesn't work. How do you know? <laughs> How do you know it doesn't work? Anyway, silly, right? These are silly arguments. These are really actually rather childish, but I digress. A lot of people read that kind of stuff and they think, well, see, that's because the temple was all about getting severed, but it's not. The temple ritual was not about getting severed because remember, the temple ritual was for those who are already born again, who are already in the covenant. That You couldn't even go to the temple and really participate in this stuff unless you were in the covenant already, which means you were already saved. Right? So... What's really the what's really the core purpose of the temple? The core purpose of the temple, as it just as I just read, is designed to connect us with God. That's the purpose. Okay. And that's why you don't need the temple to connect with God, because it was a means to an end. Understand? Okay, so it says the source of all life and vitality was the temple. When we experience an encounter with death, decay, depression, mortality, or some other antithesis of life, 
The overwhelming confrontation with the apparent futility of life renders us temporarily incapable of participating in the life-affirming rituals of the temple and the other ancillary activities associated with it. Now, this is going back to the discussion about why, if a woman is gives birth to a baby, is she ritually impure? She didn't do anything wrong. Having a baby is amazing. It's wonderful. It's great. So what's the problem? Because the baby, as we talked about, the baby, and think about the baby thing, right? Uh, a, a woman who has a baby, which is a great experience. However, ladies, I've never had a baby, obviously. Thank God. And uh, I also know which bathroom to use. But ladies, having a baby involves some uncomfortableness, correct? For those of you who have had children, not all women have had children. Not all women can, and that's not their fault. But for those of you who have, is there a little bit of uncomfortableness in that experience? Yes. Okay, so Devorah says yes. All right, or Peaches says yes. Um, Leah says for sure. All right, yeah, right. So, okay, where does that come from? I mean, I'm not talking about scientifically, we, we obviously, but... What I mean is, is that the very fact that a woman has pain, let's call it, un she because a woman has discomfort in childbirth, that is a result of the sin, say it with me, of Adam and Eve, right? That was one of the things that was said to Eve, you're going to have, right, discomfort in childbirth, correct? Pain, actually. Yeah, you're right, Peaches. Peaches like, just say it like it is, Rabbi. Pain. It's like somebody asked Conan the Barbarian, does anything hurt you? Only pain. That's what he said in Conan the Destroyer. It's one of my favorite lines. Does anything hurt you? Only pain. So, yes, it's pain. But that becomes that. So, in other words, every time a woman has a baby, which is a wonderful experience. It's a blessed experience. It's a joyful experience. And yet it's a reminder of the Garden of Eden. Just like at a wedding, every time we have a beautiful wedding, the man stomps the glass. Why does he stomp the glass? He stomps the glass to remind us that the temple is destroyed. So in the midst of a great wedding, at the end of the wedding where everybody's supposed to cheer for the happy couple, he stomps the glass. Why? To remind us that at our highest joy, we remember Jerusalem. That's the reason. And so it's a confrontation with death. Now, a lot of, let me just say it plainly, a lot of Christians are happy that the temple is destroyed, which, is, by the way, is a very spiritually sick-minded attitude to have. If you're a Christian listening to me today and you're, you're just tuning in because you're curious, you're not really sure, or maybe you're tuning in because you don't like us, which I can't imagine why, Anyway, you don't like us and you think that we're off and you're you're taking notes to try to find out uh, and prove us wrong, which is great. Keep doing that. Please dig, 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 dig into the scriptures. Find that Tanakh verse. Find that gospel verse that proves us wrong. Please, 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 please do that. Please keep doing it. Um, and so anyway, you're you're sitting there and you're you're frustrated, but I. I I want you, I want to, for your sake, I want you to please dispense with the attitude that you're so, you're so glad the temple was destroyed. That is a very, very blasphemous attitude to have. A lot of Christians, and I've, I've even had Christians say to me that, that, that JC destroyed the temple. I mean, it's, it's crazy, but please don't say that. Okay. Because the temple was a place of life. The, pl the temple was a place of con connectivity to God. Uh, listen, I've been in Jerusalem at the, at the Kotel, and I have overheard Christians looking disgustingly at the, the Kotel, the Western Wall. And, and I've heard them in my ears because they don't, they don't, they don't know that I can speak English because I, I look like I'm an Israeli. And they say, yeah, look at all those people down there just just praying to dead stones. 
Okay, if you're a Christian, you're listening to me, please do not ever say that. And if you've said or thought something like that, ask God to forgive you right now because you're talking about his holy house. It's 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 incredibly bad, okay? Now, it goes on to say, similarly, any nexus point between life and death, such as childbirth, forces us to focus on our mortality. That's what I was trying to say the other day. Thereby rendering us susceptible to pessimistic inactivity or depression until we undergo a process of purification designed to reorient us towards life activity and, and optimism. This is why in Hasidic Judaism, it's been taught that if you're depressed, you really can't serve God. Not that, you know, I mean, it, it's what it means is we can only serve him in a, in a, a time of, of joy. This is why in Hasidic Judaism, everybody everybody was always encouraged encouraged to have amuna and to have and to have faith and to have bitcoin trust in god because when we trust god even when we're going through a difficult time it brings joy a level of joy because we recognize that well this must be for my very best in other words even in this bad situation or seemingly bad situation i can have joy because i understand that ultimately this is um this is for my good, right? Okay, so that's the, that's the idea. Now, with all of that said, now we're going to transition. No pun intended. Get it? Childbirth transition. Um, we're going <laughs> to transition now to this concept of Zarat, and we're going to be looking at the Kale Tumash. This is actually a com this is a commentary to chapter thirteen. We're we're, we're still in chapter thirteen uh, in verse one. Let me just read the uh, Kale Tumash expanded version of this verse, and then I'm going to read the subsequent um, commentary. It says, God spoke to Moses, okay, that's how chapter 13 starts out, instructing him to convey his words to Aaron, saying, in addition to contracting ritual defilement through birth, death, or certain discharges from the reproductive organ, the possibility will exist from now on for a person or, or his or her possessions to become ritually defiled by a condition referred to as zarat. Remember, zarat is not leprosy, because fabrics can can get zarat, and you know your your fabric or your 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 wall can't get leprosy. So it says the symptoms of which are specific types of lesions or dis disorient uh, dis discolorations, as follows. This condition specifically affects individuals. Now, listen to this. This is the part I wanted you to, to hear because that's what we're going to be comment, commenting on in just a moment. This condition specifically affects individuals of otherwise sterling character and moral excellence who have committed the sin of gossip, slander, or haughtiness. In other words, this affliction was for those who were otherwise great people, godly people, people who actually followed the laws of Moses. They just got into Lashon Hara. Okay? So it says, if Zarat appears on their bodies, it will appear on their heads if they are guilty of haughtiness, and elsewhere if they are guilty of gossip or slander. Now, let's look at the insight. It, this, is, this insight was the inspiration for the Rosie the Riveter thumbnail. It says, the task of refining ourselves, of realizing the Torah's vision for us as human beings, is long and arduous, but, but entirely possible to implement. Yes, re refinement takes work, okay? And that's one of the problems, by the way, in our modern society particularly, of people's aversion to the law of Moses because it requires effort and people are lazy in general, generally, generally, and, and, and lazy spiritually. And, and listen, people are brainwashed every single week. They go to religious institutions and they're told God's going to do it all for you. You don't have to do anything. He's going to do it all for you. But, but by the way, that's not true, is it? Did God say the sinner's prayer for you? Did God get baptized for you? 
Does God take communion for you? But see, it's not true, right? Does God go to church for you? Does he read your Bible for you? Does he pray for you? You see what I'm saying? So it's it's all it's all smoke and mirrors. It's a, it's a shell game. It's all See, the truth of the matter is is that people actually follow a law. It's just not the law of God. But anyway, I digress. So it's long and arduous, but entirely possible to implement. The Torah itself testifies that fulfilling the, its instructions is not in heaven, not beyond the sea, but very close to you, in your mouth and in your heart, making it easy for you to fulfill it. Moreover, at each step of the way, God assists us in navigating the subtle pitfalls that threaten to thwart our progress. In the words of our sages, when somebody sets out to purify himself, he is assisted from above. See, that's the other thing that people have lied to you about. They've said that no one, no one can follow the law of Moses. First of all, it's just not true. It's 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 preposterous. That that mindset that no one can keep the law is ridiculous. It's anti-scriptural. It's it's little, literally the opposite of what God said. But beyond that, the idea itself is just preposterous and foolish. But going even deeper, Judaism says, quoting here from um, the, uh, the Sifra. Or not, not the Sifra, excuse me. That's not the footnote. It's quoting here from the Talmud, Shabbat 104a, that when we set out to keep the laws of Moses, that's what it means by when it says purifier himself, it's talking about keeping the law of Moses. When we set out to do that, God helps us. God assists us. Now, that, doesn't that make sense? If Hashem asks you to do something and you are going to do it, isn't it true that he helps you? Or doesn't it make sense rather that he would help you? Since you're doing his will, I mean, come on, parents. How many of you tasked your teenager with something, some chore, but yet, you know, you went out to help them? I, you know, I, just, I just saw an, an example of this the other day. My next, my next door neighbor, he had his son out there, uh, had the boy uh, doing the lawn, but and there was dad. Dad was right there. Uh, helping him, uh, you know, start the lawnmower and giving him some instruction and helping him pick up some stuff, you know. The boy was doing it, but dad was there to assist, right? And that's a perfect example of how Hashem helps us when we set out to follow the Torah. Why does he help us? Because he wants us to do it. He, and he knows we can. Yes, we can. We Yes, we can do it, Okay. The only people, by the way, who say you can't do it are, are the, all, the only people who say that no one can keep the law of Moses are the people who've never tried. That is a fact. That is a fact. And, and that's true, by the way, in, in, in lots of things in life. The only people who tell you that you can't do anything in life are the ones who've never even tried to do it. Okay? No one can do that. That's too hard. Have you tried? Well, no. But how do you know? Well, I, you know, I don't know. Be be careful, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, of people who will give you advice on something they've never done. You know, not everybody enjoys my humor, and that's okay. Um, I, I'm I'm humorous uh, by nature. It, it, it just it is who it is who I am, and it's always been this way. Since I was a, a young, a, since I was a young child, and uh, my wife loves it. I mean, she, oh my god, does she love it? <laughs> but anyway, I digress. Not everybody, everybody appreciates my humor, right? And that's okay. But a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, I got an email from somebody, somebody that I knew, somebody who was in the congregation at the time, and they wanted to give me advice on how to present my droshes. And this person uh, told me to cut it down to 20 minutes. I'm not making, the, I'm not kidding you. Okay. 20 minutes and blah, 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 some other things. And one of the things they said is cut out the humor, cut out the humor entirely. Let it go. Well, what was interesting, and this is so interesting, right? Because it just so happened that at that time, I was reading a book that my father had given me, which was written by a man 
who was a, a professional um, public speaking coach who had coached many presidents and high, high people who gave speeches and so forth. And it just so happened that in the chapter in which I was reading, the man was talking about how essential humor is to public speaking and that it's one of the things that is the most difficult thing for people to grasp, to be able to do, I'm talking about. Um, and that uh, he, that's the thing he, he has to spend the most time on, help coaching people to help them to loosen up and be a little bit, you know, a little bit witty, a little bit funny. I was not kidding you. I was reading that chapter when literally when that email came in, I was reading that chapter. And so I actually quoted the book back to the person. But here's the other thing I want to say about that. And this is an encouragement to you. That was just my experience. I'm just giving you as, as, as an example. This person who emailed me has never stood up in front of a crowd in their life and given any type of public dis discourse at any time in their life. Not to a crowd of two or three or 10 or a thousand. They've never spoken in front of a camera. They've never done any public speaking at all. You see what I'm saying? So my point to you now, this doesn't mean that I don't take constructive criticism. Don't please don't misunderstand. But I only take constructive criticism from people who've actually done something that I'm doing. And so should you. That's what I was trying to tell you. Don't take advice from people who've never done it. Okay. I would, I am not a carpenter. I would not dare give Zake and Yagal advice on how to do carpentry. That would be, what's the word? Stupid. Okay. And if he listened to me, that'd be even more dumb because I don't know anything about it. Right. Don't let people give you advice about something they've never done that you're doing. Okay. So Going back to our, going back to our our commentary here, the principle is demonstrated clearly by the phenomenon of zarat, which affects only individuals. So zarat affected only individuals who can who have resigned, refi, excuse me, refine themselves as much as they can using all the resources available to them: the study of the Torah, the practice of the commandments, introspection, repentance, cultivation of ethical conduct in business and personal life the development of mature faith, trust in God, devotion to one's divine mission, alacrity in performing it, and so on. They, they've done it. They're, they're doing it. They're doing a great job. But they require more refinement. So it says, utilizing all these tools to the fullest, the individual might eventually purge all the drosh from his psyche, thereby transforming himself into an altogether righteous person. Is it possible to become a righteous person? Yes. How do we know? Because God said we could. Yes, we can do it. How do we know? Because God said so. So, so this person could even reach a level, where it says here, where they no longer really wrestle with the evil inclination. I mean, they've pretty much got that under control. That doesn't mean they don't have temptations, but, you know, they, they, they're able to war against it. It says such a person's life chain life challenge is now to constantly ascend even higher to even higher levels of divine consciousness and to inspire others to implement his example. On the other hand, after the individual has exhausted all these tools, some subtle evil might still remain lurking so deep within the individual that he himself may never have become aware of it. When this is the case, God signals him to this effect by afflicting him with Zarat. So in other words, now we see that Zarat, and this is bringing us to the point of sometimes afflictions are a matter of God's grace. Wow. Yeah. Because see, you might have an affliction in your life and you, you're thinking, why, why did this happen to me? But the reason it happened is because God was trying to deal with something in your life. I know this has happened to me where you're afflicted and you're like, okay, so there's something about me that needs to be refined. And so it causes you to go into deep introspection, deeper introspection. And God may reveal to you the reason this happened is because X, Y, Z, and now you've got to deal with that. So in other words, Zarat happened only to the individual who was already on a high level. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to hurry. So it says, is, it is therefore understood. This will be our final thing uh, for this. 
Um, because this answers the question of why Zarat doesn't exist anymore. It said, is therefore understood why Zarat no longer occurs. Since the destruction of the temple, it is simply not possible for us to refine ourselves so consummately that the only imperfection left within us is that that needs to be signaled by the onset of Zarat. When the only evil remaining within a person, so, so we don't have Zarat anymore because we're not able to get to that level anyway without the temple, without being able to be drawn so close into God's presence. So there's no need to afflict us with Zarat because we, we're, not even, we're not even there yet. We're, we're still in the prerequisite courses, okay? This is why we need the, the, the base of Migdash, why we need the Holy Temple may be rebuilt soon and, and may Mashiach come. So one final paragraph and we'll conclude. We'll come back tomorrow and continue talking about refinement. Tomorrow we'll be talking more about um, some other, um, a, lot, a lot of this kind of dovetails in with, with Musar, obviously, because that's really what the root of Zarat is, 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 is bad Musar. So it says here, when the only evil remaining within a person is of subtle nature, it can only surface in a very superficial, unpremeditated behavior. The archetype of such behavior is gossip, which often takes the form of casual a casual remark that slips through an otherwise, uh, a otherwise innocent conversation. Speech is indeed a superficial activity and is therefore relatively easy to control, this being the reason why it is one of the first aspects of life that we, lives that we are forbidden to refine, or we are bidden rather to, to refine. But it is also an expression of the soul, and therefore unrehearsed speech can at times betray the inner recesses of the heart, which is exactly what Yeshua said. He said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That, see, Yeshua saying that, that is a deeply embedded pharisaical Jewish thought. That's why we have to work on our words. And it takes a lot of work. It's like Yaakov said, who can tame the tongue? End of our Aliyah today. Yes, we can do it. We can keep the Torah. We're doing it. And don't let people tell you that you can't when they've never even tried. Thank you so much for being here. Please be sure and like this video, share it with all of your friends, comment on it. If you enjoy these teachings, if you're uh, appreciative of Lapid Judaism, please donate to our ministry. We have uh, information in the every video has information about how to donate, how to give. If you are a part of Lapid and you consider this your community, wherever you are in the world, please be committed to tithing. That is, I'm making that big push. I want 100% of our members and families to be tithers. That's we're, because that's how we're really going to make a difference. It's going to be a spiritual difference. It's going to be a catastrophic. So thank you so much for being here. Look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Until then, have a great and amazing day.